big hello and a very warm welcome to a special mentorship mini-series called Starting Up with Ronit Kruvala. Starting Up is in vogue and startups the current flavor of the country. While we still have miles to go before we actually become a nation where entrepreneurship is nurtured, encouraged and cultivated, we have still come a long way from where we were even five years ago. But for those of us who dare to dream and embrace the uncertainty that comes with becoming an entrepreneur, very rarely does one get the opportunity to interact and seek advice from an entrepreneur who has been there and done that and is a role model for the young and restless. So this is really eating out endeavor to not only celebrate the individuals who have managed to get out of their comfort zone and tread the lonely path of entrepreneurship, but also provide them a platform where they can be mentored by one of India's most celebrated entrepreneurs. As the show suggests, I'm talking about none other than Ronnie Skruvala. Ronnie really needs no introduction at all, but for the uninitiated, Ronnie's journey is a rather inspiring one that spans from cable TV to toothbrush manufacturing, from theatre to media and entertainment. Founder of one of India's largest media and entertainment conglomerates, UTV, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ronnie Skruvala. Thank you so much for joining us, Ronnie. Truly a pleasure having you on the show, and thank you so much for doing this. I'm enjoying it. This is the second week and I'm already enjoying it. Also joining us today are three very dynamic entrepreneurs. Naya Sagi, founder of Baby Chakra, Hilman Satyanarayanan, founder of Imagine It, and Vidya Radhakrishnan, founder of Helios Media. And with that, let me put the spotlight on the first entrepreneur for today, and that's Naya Sagi. But before I throw it to you, Naya, let's take a look at Naya's backstory and, you know, what she was really doing before she turned entrepreneur. <laughs> Hi, my name is Naya Sagi. I'm 31 years of age. I grew up in Calcutta, went to undergrad at National Law School, Bangalore, went on to join McKinsey and Company as a consultant, and went on to do my MBA at Harvard Business School. When I moved back to India, my co-founder Mitesh and I were discussing different startup options, and what we realized was that there were young parents, millions of young parents who were in Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups, desperately searching for information on local care services for their children. Things like pediatricians, OBGYN, going on to play schools, activity centers, daycares, etc. So with an initial seed capital of about 15 lakhs, Mitesh and I decided to found Baby Chakra. <laughs> Well, now that we know your backstory, Naya, it's over to you on what really Baby Chakra is all about. Sure. Um, so we started Baby Chakra a year back to really disrupt the way parents make decisions. Uh, what Baby Chakra does is it helps parents discover and decide on local services. So right from when you're expecting a baby, so minus nine, to when your child is five years of age, so minus nine to five, there's a plethora of local services you look for, you know, starting off with cord blood banks, maternity hospitals, pediatricians, OBGYNs, play schools, activity centers, daycares. So what Baby Chakra does is actually creates a community platform, very strongly social integrated, that helps you make better decisions as a parent. Where does the need come from? Um, just from what I see around me, 60% of India today lives in nuclear families. So the structures, as you know, at Rani don't exist anymore. You don't have mother-in-laws and sister-in-laws and friends who are in the same life stage or locality as you. So more and more young women and young dads are turning online to make decisions. Uh, so the WeWork is actually very different and very unique. So unlike a typical classified platform, uh, what we do is we actually crowdsource recommendations on local, on local services from thousands of parents in the cities they are in, and we profile those services. So it's a basic aggregation of everything that you want to know in that city. Absolutely. So it's very specific. It is pretty specific. Well, it's hyper local. Right the way we've been doing marketing so far has been very interesting. I think uh, we've actually been following an influencer strategy that we developed in house. So. Um, each locality in each city is divided into, uh, is actually um, owned by a mom's champion, as we call it. We've identified these local influencers, and we work very closely with her, and, and in, 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 actually, in Toronto, she's an evangelist for Baby Chakra. Uh, so her role is to tell us what are sort of the, lo the best local services, and also promote lo Baby Chakra among her community, both online and offline. Now, with the pedigree that you have, so you sort of all define a sort of a vision statement and what you want to be through Absolutely. Now. So, so that, that's our mission is to disrupt the way parents make decisions. Um, not just in India, potentially globally as well, because the need exists. Um, the second thing. So when you say disrupt, what do you mean by that? I mean, because now that's <laughs> the need to first rub before they disrupt. Right. right. <laughs> so, so 
so what we realize is that uh, parents are struggling, um, and th these are critical care decisions they're making, right? So give us a little bit of statistics, and I know time is short, so I'm sure. just going to get a little bit. Yeah. Give us some statistics of where you've reached in this one and a half Absolutely. Or one year. Absolutely. So this month we closed at about half a lack users. Uh, 50, monthly users. 50,000 users. Yes. Okay. Um, we have about 4,500 local services. We've signed up with about 20 experts. What are your challenges or what are your questions on the show? So my challenges are just how to sort of capture, so there's so much noise uh, that's been created in terms of, um, you know, capturing consumer mind share, it, it, regardless of funding. What right. are interesting ways you've seen, you know, you've done Hangama, right? So what are interesting ways you've seen in which a startup like mine can actually, you know, go out, talk to parents and really connect And with what them. are you doing presently in terms of marketing other than the word of mouth? program. Yes. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been actually leveraging a lot. So we've been tying up with uh, a lot of big brands have approached us and we've been using their social media to reach out to a broader audience. Um, so for instance, J&J &J and uh, Danone and all keep tweeting us, Mom and Me keep tweeting us. Uh, so we That's not going to get you scared. Exactly. So um, the other thing we're trying uh, is also sort of a mix of offline and online. So we're sort of focusing our resources more. So this on is your business. Uh, you can actually figure out that in the class of society or in the segments that yeah. you want to be, especially in these two cities, yeah. there will be statistics, definitely statistics of the born and f plus up to five years. Yeah. That there's going to be, so why don't you focus on that? Because that is something that is data crunching, which you can be specific about. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go with wasteful media for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And the zero to nine, the discovery processes, they are obviously going to some medical outreach program. If you get those two hubs, mm. what is that market size? Is that how, how in a city like Mumbai, mm -hmm. is that a million people? Is that five, fifty thousand? Is that what is that range? Have you figured that out? We have. So, uh, but, you know, again, Ronnie, because of the content platform that we have, our, our market is not just Bombay. It's also sort of the 30 million mothers, and therefore, just sort of aggregating that, the 60 million young dads, uh, 60 million young parents online, right? So, for us, the market is largely the parents online because they're already online, they're already educated okay. and using online, All right. right? All right. So, for that, we've been trying. And where are they online today? Uh, they're online on social media, they're online on and, Google. And their and parents, or their. Are they they're in that range. Yeah, in that range, and they're exactly. How did you figure that part out? Um, so just by doing the data crunching we talk okay. about. Good. So that's your focus in order. Exactly. Now the question is, how am I going to reach them? Absolutely. So you don't need peripheral media for that. True. So your real trigger point is that in this community of the quantity that you talk about, how do you get them into a social media platform mm. within a social media platform? Mm. Because so it's all digital. It's all digital outreach and digital marketing. It has to be. It, it has, has to be. be. Because you're offering True. an online product in any True. But if you can get them to talk to each other, yeah. and you can be that catalyst yeah. for that thought process, you're in for the long run. Yeah. My instinct tells me that you need to get that ecosystem where people are talking to each other. Yeah. If they don't get that from each other, they're not going to come back to your platform just for advice and just for where's the nearest X store or Y store yeah. or Z store. That will be transformation. That will be really disruptive. Yeah. So to that, Ronnie, I have a question. If her customers or revenue model be, is based on, you know, you're getting paid from the, from the service providers, right? Doesn't that value to credibility already? So not the basic listing, right? So you don't get listed on your platform if you're not of high quality service or you didn't come and recommend it by your parents. That's your feeding through yourself. Yes. That's your screening. Yes, we are. Okay. We are. So it's only in, you know, if you want to be even, you, you want to sort of update pictures, you want to post special offers, you want to sort of, uh, you know, really hyper locally target a certain cu customer base and you pay for that service. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for that, Naya. That was really interesting. It's time for us to take a quick break. So stick on because we have two more extremely dynamic entrepreneurs who are waiting and raring to go and you know, throw their questions at Ronnie. So stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Starting Up with Ronnie Fruwala. You just heard Naya, and now it's time for the second entrepreneur to take center stage. It's Heyman Satinarayana, founder of Imaginate. But before I throw it to you, Heyman, let's take a look at your backstory and how you, you know, went on to becoming an entrepreneur. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hemant. I'm 32 years old. I'm a graduate of IIT Madras, did my bachelor's in technology there, and I moved to US, did my master's in augmented reality, where I worked on a liver surgical apparatus. And post that, I also worked with a differentiated startup in the US near the Princeton area, where I worked on a wearable locomotion controller that could embed a soldier, a trainee soldier, in any war field simulation wherever he or she is. 
post that, I moved to India in the year 2009, where I was exploring different opportunities, what I can work on in India. That's when I decided that you know, I will start an augmented reality-based startup in India itself. And then this is because with the advent of large format displays and higher processing power, which is affordable at a very you know, cheaper price, decided to start creating solutions in the space of virtual reality and augmented reality in India. That's when I started Imagine It with an initial capital of five lakhs. Well, that was uh, Hemant's backstory and uh, Hemant's uh, quite an interesting story. Why don't you uh, talk to us about uh, Imagine It and what exactly it does in two minutes, please. Sure. Uh, uh, so Imagine It was uh, started by me uh, with the primary uh, notion of creating niche disruptive and niche uh, solutions in virtual reality and augmented reality. The first product that we developed is Trussy, uh, which is a plug and play virtual fitting room for e-commerce apparel stores. So what we do is we process users' pictures when they log in with Facebook, and we automatically set up an account for them to let them try out any dress uh, on themselves on an e-commerce store that they're visiting. So what it means is that I don't have to upload a picture. I, I already have pictures on Facebook that I could consider uh, using with Jussie to get a look of any dress that I'm looking at on an e-commerce store. So this is not a B2C service, meaning B2B, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's really two stores sure. from all perspectives. Exactly. Consumer is obviously the end user, but it's to the source. Yeah, exactly. dealing is to the source. Exactly. So, so that's where my first question is, if I can ask that. Sure. Uh, so, so, uh, so we are enabling virtual fitting rooms for e-commerce apparel stores uh, and who are competing with, with the big ones out there uh, who need this, this, this uh, differentiator for themselves. And at the same time, as you said, uh, we are delivering the service to the, to, the sh to the shoppers out there. So the shoppers at some point of time would connect with Jussie, yeah. you know, relate to Jussie, and then you know, once they see Jussie on a store, uh, they know that it's a virtual fitting room and they can try out a dress there. So, uh, so what you're trying to do you know, going forward is to aggregate all these apparels yeah. and then actually launch, so our the own, uh, launch our own B2C app, which is Jussie. I just have one issue on the, yeah. the credibility part. You're doing this. Yeah. You're de dealing with companies. Yeah. What is the final fit that goes out? For whatever different reasons, is yeah. not the fit yeah. it is. Sure. The credibility of yours also goes down because the next time they're going to use your app, they're not going to use your application. So now your question is that how do I go to B2C? Yeah, so uh, my question is how, when is a good time to go to B2C? Should we aggregate all the apparel by ourselves? You use the word niche in the beginning. If you're saying that only one hundredth of people who buy fashion online mm -hmm. will try, sure. is, that, is that your sense? Because you can only go B2C if you're going to say my product will reach out anyone and everyone who wants to buy fashion online so has to use my product. I would sure. say that's your first day in which you can figure out you have a possible B2C model. Does that make sense? Today, based on the contracts that you have and the people you service, are you right. doing 1% of people are trying, your, trying you of the, of the community that's buying fashion online, half a percent, 10%, 5%? Yeah, so uh, in terms of people that we have targeted, uh, so, uh, we only have about few e-commerce stores where we, where we are live. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, with us to do a on, a, on an e-commerce store. And in that store, uh, we have about 27% of people who are actually trying the dress. See, these percentages don't make a difference if your base is small. So we all get a very carried away with 27%, 40%. Right. So it depends on what the base is. My sense on your scaling mm -hmm. and your B2C model is first, get to critical mass. Okay. Second is, are you are you servicing at least five percent of the overall fashion consumption market online? Mm -hmm. People with people using it through a B two B model, sure. because then you know that you're onto something. First time you need to figure out whether you're onto something. Okay. Second, if you're onto something big, mm -hmm. and the best way to do that is working through a lot more people sure. in the B two B business, sure. and then forcing them or forcing yourself to work with them as how do we get more of your customers to be, to for this to be the litmus test to buy fashion. Sure. I think those are the two critical stages you have to go through. Sure. You will automatically have an answer of whether I'm ready to go out on my own after those two things. Okay. That's my sense. Great. And now for the last and final entrepreneur for today, it's Divya Radhakrishnan from Helios Media. But before, of course, we come to Divya, let's take a look at you know your backstory in the whole media business before you decide to turn on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Divya Radha Krishnan, and I'm very happy that we, at the age of 50, I'm part of a program on startups. I started my career 25 years ago in the field of advertising and media, and my education in advertising and media happened while on the job, and I'm part of the media industry when it was considered to be a backing function, uh, and, and slowly and gradually it came into the front stage, and eventually I, I was heading uh, media, public relations, and even companies of redefusion YNR 
and after running the business for some time, I realized I had the potential to start out on my own, and thus I founded Helios Media. Well, uh, that's truly an inspirational story, and uh, you know, uh, at 50, you seem as young as any of or any of our panelists today. And uh, with that, of course, let's throw it to you, uh, Divya, on what the motivation was to really, you know, throw off such a great career in startup. Um, so, as you all would know, uh, television industry today is about 850 channels, and as a media planner buyer, <clears throat> you are constantly looking for solutions for your brand that wish to communicate to the same audience that the television channels were talking to. And somewhere the twins wouldn't meet. So the challenge was that if I'm going to talk to the same audience, why can't I talk in, such, in the manner in which the content guys hold attention for 22 minutes? And the big, biggest part was the audiences have moved ahead, consumers have mo moved ahead, marketers and broadcasters are still behind trying to catch up. So the thought was that uh, why don't I start a company where I start talking to the market like how I want, how would I wanted the sales team to the which market, to the advertising market? Advertise. Okay. It's a complete B2B. Mm -hmm. So like how I would have wanted the sales teams to talk to me if, when I was a buyer. So what's the credibility you offer on this right now? Uh, the Why thing should is, people listen to you? Yeah. So what happens is when people are part of network and they're part of larger networks, which are like four or five in this country, which control a decent part of advertising pie. The good news is there are almost 250 channels that are independent. Mm -hmm. And when you're independent, what you have to do is to, you have to look at the same talent pool for hiring, and you're obviously not able to match the pay scales, and you end up hiring substandard talent. And when you end up hiring substandard talent, they're not able to monetize you very well. And most of these 250 independent channels are speciality channels. Speciality channels cannot be sold with the numbers because they don't really generate numbers. Yeah. You're going to sell them the platform. And to sell them the platform, you need to have a team who understands the content space more intensely. So you standardized that and you've made that into a cluster of people that yes. services people who can't afford to do this analysis in-house. That's right. By standardizing it for them and offering to them. And monetizing it and even yes. bringing in the revenue. Uh, when you're selling services, which is primarily a contract, yes. which are getting value, yes. it's extremely difficult to pitch it to an investment company. So, so why are you thinking of this as an investment company? You've just started a business. You yes. want to grow that business. Yes. It sounds like a good, neat business to run, and that's what you want to do. You want it to go out and be on your own. Right. Not every business has to have an investor. Not every business has to have an exit plan. Not every business is ever going to get listed or going to get sold. But why at this stage and age? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean from the exit point of view. Yeah. I meant from the point of view of expansion. Yes, but I'm just telling you yeah. that the minute you get an investor, you have to start thinking of how that person is going to create value and exit yeah. at some stage. Yeah. Is this a business that in four years, five years, six years, is going to create some value which will be of some value to somebody else? I think it, it quintessentially sounds like an extremely nice, good business to run. Mm -hmm. That will be for a core team. Mm -hmm. It has to be profitable. Mm -hmm. Yes, you need to make some initial investments and then go forward. Yes. So my question to you is why are you thinking of an external investor? I know you need the money. Yeah. So that's your initial reflex. Yeah. But maybe you need to go at it step by step mm -hmm. and grow a business that is profitable. Use the surplus money from that profitability to expand your service. Intuitively, I think that might be the more practical route because to get somebody in to buy in in terms of investment, I think the sum is too small. Mm. Now, you may get an angel investor. You may get one or two investors that have a passion and want to understand this business and say it sounds great I want to back you. That's a different capital altogether because it's friendly capital. Right. But then it still needs some friendly servicing at the end of four years. <laughs> yes, yes. Unless you want the friendly part to be unfriendly by that. <laughs> so I think just not to sort of the belittle that, I, I want you to understand that it sounds like a good business. Why don't you make it into a good profitable business mm -hmm. and from positive cash flows grow that business? To me, that sounds the definition of the business that you're defining. What's the biggest scale? What can you be four years from now? What do you think you can be four years from now? I think uh, um, uh, it, I would like to see the company going into the largest space of content, not restrict to broadcast. Yes, so okay. When you want to expand. So that's where you need technology investments and whatever else. Yes, yes. Fine. But that niche, you're going to experiment, you're going to invest, and you're going to lose money on a B2B client basis, which I would not recommend you do. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, you can't keep losing on a service that you're offering people where your operating costs are higher right. than what clients are willing to pay you. That would be the first fundamental of the business. And sure, right now India is booming and there's a lot of attraction in the whole space. So you might find some attractive one or two investors. But at the core of it, yours is a business that needs to be profitable and has to have a margin business from day one. 
Uh, but yeah, I hope that was, uh, you know, satisfying and hope uh, Ronnie's candid comments uh, have uh, given you some direction for the future. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Time for us to take a quick break. Stay tuned. It's coming up. We have a very dynamic set of people who, in the audience are going to throw some really tough questions to Ronnie. Ronnie, I hope you're prepared. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Starting Up with Ronnie Truvala. And now it's time to, uh, you know, turn the spotlight on to uh, this very, very patient set of people in the audience who are sitting here and, you know, waiting to ask questions uh, to Ronnie. And even if you want to ask the panelists, feel free to. So who goes first? Sir, when you, when you advised uh, Divya, ma'am, you, yes. you talked a bit about the age and the maturity of the team. So when you're looking at, uh, at a business, at a startup, how important is age and the relative maturity of the team to you when evaluating the success factor? I think the entrepreneur is very, very important. I don't think age is a criterion in the context at all. Uh, I think the maturity is very, very important. You can be a very mature 26, 27. Now, with all limitations, you can be that mature 26, 27. But it's really about the entrepreneur because the clarity of the thought process, the ability to attract people, the way you can communicate your idea, you get that clarity. I think it's all about that. So it really finally boils down to the entrepreneur, not the age. I want to know what's your view on uh, crowdsourcing is wh why isn't uh, really picking up in India? I think the question is in a mature market where everyone's online, the trust is online, your ability to contribute is online, and your uh, actual satisfaction that you're getting there is much more. Here I think that communicated, uh, community, community is very small. The payout of people who've done it before actually have not serviced it properly. Because you're in a crowdsourcing, then you want to feel involved. You don't feel involved. You haven't got that gratification over a period of time. You're not going to do it again. So a little bit, I think, it's a smaller core. That small core has not been serviced, and therefore it's not going to a larger core. But So it's a slow process in India. If you are, have the patient that says, I want to stick in and I really believe in it, I think in five to seven years it will be an interesting segment. But before that, I think it's going to remain niche. Hi, I'm Anisha. What do you look at while you're investing in a team? in a startup and uh, with that is um, when I'm, I'm actually launching a company with a friend of mine so what would you advise to people launching I mean what are the failures or something you would look at so that you don't fail I mean so what are the uh, drawbacks in starting a startup and Ronnie this is your pitch to read your book so let, 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 me, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me try and answer a very very broad question you are looking at the entrepreneur and you are going to spend a lot of time with the entrepreneur to understand exactly how they're going to think, what is their real clarity of thought, and whatever else. So that is really going to boil down to that. <coughs> if they're co-founders, that's good. We'll have to understand how are they more complementary. Is that they just got together because both are thinking alike, or actually there are distinct complementary skills, and you need to sort that out. What roles are each of you all going to handle? Get to the clarity of that before you go to anyone outside. Because people will look for that complementary skills of each other. If you're good at this and this one's good at this, 2 plus 2 is equal to at least 6 if not 4. Nobody's expecting it to look like at 22. Uh, you have to fail. So stop looking for ways not to fail to start a business because that's not going to happen. And I don't mean just go out and fail, just go out and fail. But I'm just saying you need to. So stop worrying about how am I going to put my speed breakers, what speed breakers should I look for? Because then all you'll be doing is looking down and you won't be looking up. So don't look for that in that context. Understand it, spend the time for pre-planning, do what you think you need to do to get the business all ready up. And if you're not in a hurry and you're starting up in that thought process, if you think you want to start in three months, take six months uh, to eliminate the process of thinking it through. But don't worry about failing. So Ronnie, my favorite question to you is that if I had to force you to pick one of the three startups today on display, which one would you invest? And my favorite answer is that I don't normally get forced to <laughs> make an investment in that context. But uh, and I think each of them have got their own, but if I had to choose, it would be Baby Chakra, because I think it's got the potential, it's got that element of being able to scale, if nurtured where it can, but whereas the other two, I think, have still got either clarity or are neat businesses on their own. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Starting Up with Ronnie Suvala. Hope you enjoyed the show. Next week, we'll be back with three more dynamic entrepreneurs, a fresh set of problems, and of course, the man himself, Ronnie Suvala. Until next week, I'm going to leave you with this thought. It's never too late to go out there and start up.